place in uh, the early 90s, and I'm on a family vacation in the Adirondacks. Um, our kids are seven and three. And it's raining, and they're kind of like bouncing off the walls, so we decide to hop in the car and go for a drive. And just explore the area. We're in the Old Forge area of the Adirondacks. And so we're driving around, and we see this big billboard, and it says, come fly with Bird, B-Y-R-D. So I figure it's one of your relatives. <laughs> so we take the turn, we go down the, uh, the dirt road to find a lake with a guy who's got a couple of seaplanes. And we hadn't been on a seaplane. So we find out that we can go up for $40. This is 1991 or something like that. So we're flying over mountains, lakes, and trees, and it's just gorgeous. And something happens inside of me, like time stops, sound shuts off, and I don't really know what's happening, but it's huge. And we land, we get back down, and I said to my former husband, I don't know what happened, but I have to have whatever that was again. And he said, you can go to the airport in Bennington, sit on the left-hand side of the plane, work the rudder, you know, work all the controls. And I'm looking at him like he's got not two heads, but three heads, because I'm not courageous at that point. So fast forward two weeks, I'm in aerobics. It's September, and I'm jumping around, you know, doing what I do by the window. And the sky in September is an entirely different blue. And I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden, I feel this ache in my gut. And I realize I have to go fly an airplane. So after class, I hop in the car. I drive over, no, I'm serious! <laughs> I drive over to the airport and I sign up for flying lessons. And it's like the best thing I ever did in my life for three reasons. One, I became a better parent. I no longer hovered over my children. I had my own passion and they saw it. Like the night before a lesson, I'd be standing in front of the TV looking for the weather report. And if it was clear and calm, I was ballistic. I was jumping up and down like a kid. and. It was like, it became my passion. It also put my other fears in perspective. Um, I was, uh, I signed up to race at Bromley at the innkeepers program. And it's the first day, I'm nervous, I'm in my bibs, brushing my teeth. And I'm thinking, why are you nervous? You fly an airplane. So it just like <laughs> slams everything into perspective. And the other thing that it did was it helped me to trust. I had to trust an air, this plane. I had to trust this person who was the instructor. And the hardest part was I had to trust myself. And it, it really was the best thing I ever did. Um, even though it was challenging at times, I never felt more alive. Awesome. This is the first time we've had a stage. Um, just so you know, so be careful stepping up here. There's supposed to be a makeshift steps up there, but I blocked it, of course. So um, I'll put this over here, just in case you guys need a stand, and uh, and that would be uh, that would be good. Thank you very much. Anonymous flash nonfiction. You were feeling great. And then somebody and suddenly woke up to something not so great, or described something that moved you. My six-year-old who constantly asked me, Mommy, I need a question. He means I have a question. He's perfect. <laughs> great music or a good dramatic production that touches a soft spot. I only have five of these, so you know I'm gonna I'm gonna have to spread them out. Please fill them out and drop them off. I'll be sitting right here, and there's plenty all over the place, just so you know. I, anyway, what's the next name on the board? Mike. Oh, Mike. Please give a big round of applause for Mike. Thank you, Mike. I'll get up here on. I'm on lights and a big stage. Uh, I'm up here. It is kind of nice when you look out there and see everybody. Um, the theme was flying high, 
That's right. Uh, I didn't read it directly. My wife told me about it, and uh, so I, I got to thinking about that. I, I haven't uh, I haven't done anything with a parachute or jumped out of a plane. Uh, I haven't been over to Greylock and uh, ran off a cliff or anything like that. So I was trying to think about uh, a time uh, when I was physically high uh, uh, doing something, and. What, what came back to me, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Methodist minister uh, from North Carolina uh, and served a whole bunch of churches all through uh, eastern North Carolina. And uh, I had a lot of country churches, and, and in the country you meet a lot of uh, interesting people. Uh, and uh, at this one church I had, I had a guy whose name was Johnny. It was Johnny, not John. It was Johnny McGee, and his wife's name was uh, Donald Rose. And everybody called her Donald Rose, and they just accepted that. And uh, they lived with uh, uh, her mother, and her name was Winnie. And uh, so it was always Johnny and Donald Rose and Minnie, and uh, they came to church quite a lot. And uh, he was uh, kind of a self-made farmer and did a lot of things. And... Uh, uh, in the, in the South, uh, they put a great amount of pride in how they attend Sunday school and everything. And uh, uh, Johnny's wife, Donald Rose, had a, uh, they give away a, a, a pin if you attend Sunday school uh, for a whole year. And uh, Donald Rose not only had a pin, but then every year that you attend, they give you a bar to go underneath that, you know. And so uh, Donald Rose had a pin in 28 bars that just you know, came down, you know. And, and she was kind of an intimidating person, you know, oh, especially on Sunday morning, you know. <laughs> she just didn't mess with Donald Rose. Uh, and her, son, her husband, Johnny, was, you know, people often marry opposites. You know, I mean, like, Johnny didn't have any pins coming down and any bars, you know. I mean, and he, his attendance was maybe like once every three months was good, you know. But uh, anyway, one day he, 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 after church, he says, you want to come fly with me? And I said, fly? He said, yeah, sure, I got a plane. Let's go fly. And... Uh, I said, okay, sure, you know, and uh, so I drove out, I was driving out to his place, and now I assumed that when I got to his place, we would get in the car, and we would go to the airport, and there would be a hangar and the planes and, and things like that. When I got to the house, uh, he said, well, let's, let's go out to the barn, and right then I began to know this is, this is going to be different. And, and we got out to the barn, and there was this old plane. I mean, it was old and just, you know. And he said, uh, you know, well, let's pull it out and, uh, <laughs> and take it over to the pasture. And I said, really? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, I've been working on it all month, man. It, you know, it runs great, you know. <laughs> So I said, all right, okay, sure enough, you know, so uh, we got it out there, and, you know, he said, well, I got I to gotta pour some gasoline into the carburetor to get it started, and then, he, you know, you turn the switch, you know, and I'll run around and get in the cabin, and, uh, you know, I said, all right, all right, you know, so sure enough, he poured it in, I turned the switch, the engine coughed and cranked, and he ran around, got in, and, uh, you know, I was kind of so excited about that, I forgot to ask, like, is there parachutes in this plane or anything? You know? He said, no, nah, don't worry about it, you know. And, and we took off. And I mean, you know, he said, he said, it's a little bumpy, but don't worry about it. You know? So soon we, we got off, and, you know, we were circling, and it, it really is beautiful. We got up there. And, you know, we were flying, and then, you know, he'd say, well, there's John Rogers' house, and there's John, and, you know, uh, there's, there's Thelma Lou's house over there, you know, and, 
there's there's Kerr Lake up there, the big lake of uh, North Carolina. He said, nah, that's nice. He said, you want to see the nudist camp? <laughs> I said, what? He said, you want to see the nudist camp? He said, it's, it's only five minutes over there. And I said, no, I don't need to see any, you know, naked people running around. No, I don't want to He said, you sure? <laughs> You know, I, so I had to do it. I had to play my minister card. You know, I was like, no, man, I'm a minister. You know, I don't do that. You know, I was like, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. So, so we fly, flying back towards the house, and he said, there's your house. And I said, yeah, that's my house. He said, that's your wife out there in the garden, isn't it? It's so said, baby, you know. Yeah, that, that's Barbara. He said, well, let's buzz her. <laughs> and I said, let's what? He said, we're going to buzz her, man. So he started circling around, you know, and then we started doing his nose dives, you know, come down. Now my wife's a, a Baptist, you know, minister's wife, you know, kind of, you know, a little bit respectful, but she saw Johnny coming at her with this plane, and she gives him the biggest finger. <laughs> Johnny said, man, that's great. <laughs> and, you know, my foot is like going like this through the floor of this plane because I, I was like, I thought we were going to crash there for a while. But then anyway, we circled back around. And he said, well, there's your church. And I said, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's church. He said, let's buzz in. <laughs> and I said, damn, Johnny, I, I don't want to meet Jesus this way. You know? <laughs> But we buzzed it, you know, and all the little kids are out running around and screaming, you know. And he said, yeah, that's good. And I said, well, now it's time to go back home. I said, all right, yes, let's go. You know. And so we would get back to his, his, his farm, and we're starting to circle it. And, you know, I said, Johnny, there's a herd of cows there, there on your landing field, you know. And he said, Oh, don't worry about it. He said, they usually get out of the way. <laughs> and, and I said, usually? <laughs> you know, and he said, all right, you know, they, they, they're used to this. You know, we just, we just come right on down and they just, they just scatter. So, you know, of course, we come down and we're circling down. We're coming down and he, he's kind of right. They're all starting to scatter, you know, <laughs> except there's one. <laughs> It doesn't just want, it, it doesn't, it just stays there, and it's just chewing, you know, and, and I'm, I'm looking at it, and I could have swore the cow was giving me the finger, you know, I was trying to lift up its paw or something, you know, and, and I started yelling, Johnny, and all of a sudden the plane just kind of does a 90 degree, and you know, we, we kind of slide a little bit, but we stop, and he said, well, we made it. Thank God. And I said, thank you, Jesus, too. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, well, he said, I ain't doing anything next week. You want to go out again? <laughs> and, you know, there again, I had to play my minister card. I said, no, I think I got some visits to do, Johnny. I really do appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, thank you. But uh, so, uh, you know, every time. I go to the airport though, and I, you know, you walk out the tar you walk out on one of those nice little uh, enclosed things, and you get on this airplane, and you, you sit, and you have a little window of view. Um, I, I, I truly enjoy that. <laughs> I'm blessed, but I, and I do like to fly. So anyway, but that's my high flying experience. <laughs> to the end with the finger. Yeah. We made subs and soup to pay our way to Europe as Girl Scouts. After a great flight, I took out my contacts and tripped and cut open my foot on a suitcase the first day in Europe. <laughs> that sounds like a story. The sleeping bag was wait, wet, I was cold, and the tent was sagging. That's another story. 
That's terrible. That's terrible. All right, who's next? What's Judy, okay, very good. Um, please give Judy a big round of applause. She uh, drove a long way to come here. showing symptoms in my late teens and uh, by my early 20s uh, the mania had grabbed hold of my brain and I just held on and went for the ride and um, you know I looked back on my yearbook and uh, my um, fellow students wrote in <laughs> um, stay you know you know how they always say you know stay as nice as you are stay as crazy as you are you know you're such a crazy gal, stay crazy as you are, they had no idea. <laughs> so um, by my late 20s though, um, I had um, given birth to my first son, and um, by my early 30s, I had my second son, and it seemed to level out, and I seemed to be doing pretty well. And through my 30s, I was doing pretty well, but then the middle 40s, it came back, and um, the mania came back, and the highs and the lows, and I was being treated for migraines, and I had gone to Fletcher Allen, um, to a neurosurgeon, neuro, neurologist in Fletcher Allen. He was treating me for, for migraines, but I was complaining that I, could be, I, I couldn't sleep. I could be up for days, and I got a lot done, but I could be up for days. And I asked my kids, um, did this affect you, you know, later on in life? And I said, you know, growing up, did it affect you? And they said, we just thought you could do anything. And then you had to take a really long nap <laughs> because the, the depression, the crash and burn when you hit the brick wall. So my neurologist had sent me for a sleep study and I had gone to the sleep study and sure enough, I do have some form of apnea and I do have a sleep, uh, sleep pad machine. But when I went to the um, sleep specialist nurse practitioner, um, I at this point had hit a low. And when I got into her office, I got into a chair, and I curled up in a fetal position, and I couldn't take any more. And she said to me, have you ever considered you might be bipolar? And the thought had never occurred to me. So we did some chitin and gittin, and got a psychiatrist in Rutland, and I got into treatment. And um, after several years of um, uh, medication adjustment and such, I'm now healthy, and I'm happy, but I really miss the highs. <laughs> oh, thank you, Judy. I'm going to uh, hold off on this one. Does anybody else have another uh, another one? I'm going to hold. I'm going to learn this one because uh, there's there's some there's some parts of the handwriting. We have. Um, oh, thanks, hey, sir. Um, and um, who is the next uh, speaker for the night? Trevor. Trevor. Well, please give Trevor a big round of applause. So this story takes place when I was very short, very small. I was in third grade, and I was a student um, in a suburb outside DC. So all of our field trips were to the Smithsonian, or Congress, or um, sometimes we'd go to Fort McHenry. It's a great place for field trips. Although it's the same field trip over and over is kind of what we did. And um, I enjoyed that very much. 
Um, and things were pretty good from my third grade frame of reference. But my, my dad had gotten an offer for a job in Georgia, and he wanted to move. And um, my mom and my brother and I were like, well, things are pretty good here. But he was uh, intent on, um, on moving. And I think part of it was he had recently learned what the poverty line was, and he was working at it at the, um, at the college um, in the labs. So he wanted to move, and so we went with him, and my mom stayed behind. And it was, you know, raining, and we got in the VW bus, and we drove down to Georgia, and it was really hard. Um, but we made friends. They taught us how to say the word dude, and we let them jump over our bodies on their bicycles, and we shot some cans with some, you know, shot some cans off a rail with a gun, and we're fast friends. Um, and I was, I went to see the principal and they were like, you're from up north, do you want to go into fifth grade instead of fourth grade? Because you already know how to add and subtract and stuff. Um, but I just imagined being really small in high school and I was like, no. Um, so I, I stuck with fourth grade. And they were going to have a field trip, which was a rare thing for them. The fourth graders having a field trip. And the thing was, not everyone could go. This was a special field trip. They could only take so many people. And it was, it would involve a plane flight, which I'd never been on a plane. They were going to D.C., to the Smithsonian. <laughs> And it was by lottery, so I was standing in this cafeteria with all these other people thinking, there's no way they're going to pick me. Well, maybe I was a little more hopeful than that. Like, you know, I got this in the bag. And then, then I was insecure about the whole thing. And then I was like, well, I've already been, so someone else should go, and that's fine. But then they called my name, and, you know, we filled out the permission slip. And I was going to go to D.C., I was going to go on a plane, and we got a speech that um, we had to behave, or we'd let the whole state down, or, you know, they would take Georgia out of the United States, we embarrassed them. So we had, and so all these fourth graders, we get on the plane, and I don't remember anything other than this flight because this flight was extraordinary. It was my first flight. They gave me a little pair of wings, you know, and um, I got a little goodie bag and it had this notepad in it, which was perfect because the plane was filled up with these fourth graders, but it was also filled up with all the contestants for the Miss America pageant. <laughs> and they were all wearing their banners, you know, representing their state. And they were rotating. They were coming by and sitting with you and talking with you. And I just remember Miss Oregon. <laughs> she was so nice. And put me so at ease. And I forgot everything else about the Smithsonian and the whole rest of the trip. But that's just my story of flying high. <laughs> There's something about Oregon in general. <laughs> All right, we have a couple of spaces in between. Uh, my memory. Jude. But, um, so, anyway. I'll take a space. You, oh, you will? Oh, my goodness. Well, we have a uh, uh, impromptu storyteller today. This is my dad, Gary. Give him a big round of applause. Well, I uh, don't usually tell stories, but... Um, you always tell stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's a story that he doesn't tell stories. Um, so flying high has been part of my life, actually. I can remember as a farm, farm kid um, riding my bicycle down the terraces and then having to stop just before a barbed wire fence caught us. And that was, uh, that was always, a, um, shall we say, an anxiety producer for the farmer that owned the land. 
uh, and I induced my brothers to do the same. They were all younger than me, of course. So, uh, you know, generally speaking, we made it down the hill okay and stopped just before the barbed wire fence, which was always nice. Um, the other side of flying high was uh, hopping on board a Huey in Vietnam with my dog to help clear a landing zone for Marines. Uh, so that was that was an interesting, always interesting for me. Um, and uh, they did, never ever told me where I was actually going or what I was actually doing. Uh, but uh, you know, you, <laughs> you jump off the helo and you uh, and you clear the area that they tell you to clear. Okay, so that, that was always fun. Um, it uh, gave me a whole new sense of uh, um, bend over and, and kiss your ass goodbye. Um, but the story that I'd like to tell you uh, was in my college years back in the late 60s. And that is where a group of us, for some reason, got together to take LSD. <laughs> and I don't know why. So somebody out there knows why. <laughs> so what, what the, um, and then we all decided to uh, go down to Arkansas. I, this is in the Midwest, <laughs> by Joe. So we went down to Arkansas to do some canoeing and backpacking and, and caving and all that rot. And uh, we had a great, great time. Of course, it was on this uh, Timothy Leary drug. Well, uh, the, I'm not sure where it was in the trip. Uh, we had many whitewater river things that were very wonderful. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but the, the biggest, biggest thing, in fact, it still imprints on me, is when we took a couple of tabs of purple haze and dropped into the earth, um, care, uh, sliding down the ropes into this big, cavern that was only apparent by a small little hole in the earth and so of course I'm the first one and um, but everybody followed behind and uh, and of course this big cavern just blew us all away and of course the LSD had not quite yet kicked in so what was what was interesting is that we started to figure out which hole that we wanted to explore in this large cavern. So, of course, well, since I'm, I don't know whether I'm uh, amazingly stupid or carefree or whatever, so I picked a hole and we all started going down the hole. And, of course, it got began to get very, very tight. And I was one of the smaller guys. And uh, so I let, let everybody know behind me. And we... And then, of course, the LSD starts to come on. Well, <laughs> everybody's beginning to have a little fun by now. Um, and thank goodness that it, all, we are all experienced LSDers because nobody freaked out. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> you can imagine. I mean, I'm going to let your imagine run away with that one. But... Uh, so as the people backed out, and as I struggled in to get through this hole, um, it opened up into another huge cavern. And it was amazing. Well, lo and behold, the rest of the guys go around into other caverns, and we find the same, same hole in the world. And outside, there's a huge thunderstorm happening. I mean, it's... It's literally unbelievable, and we look out, and there's this like huge overgrowth, and all there is is thunder and lightning as we step out of this very dark cave. Now, it's amazing that all of us got to the same spot, first of all, but then we all are flying high on purple haze, and this is happening to us, and we all just have to sit down and go, Wow. So as you can imagine, that is probably the preeminent flying high in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Only be
inexperienced if you're going to be doing something like that. Don't 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 do that the first time. I don't think. Where do you practice? <laughs> My house. Just come over. We, we, uh, no, we have. Uh, I have an experiment here. Actually, I'm going to try reading this uh, this uh, flash nonfiction here, and uh, I had some help trying to get it figured out. I was feeling great, really being that Vermont had a great opportunity to repeat prohibition and set Vermont growers to supply the people with quality cannabis and to see all the funds to ensure quality, affordable health care for all Vermonters. But I wake up to a regressive, oppressive law that trades a legal ounce for something. <laughs> Six near ways to get a roasted get roasted to make fifteen gangs rich. I think that's pretty close. But next time, write it clearly, and we'll get the full agenda on this. Ne next time, I won't break my finger. Oh boy. <laughs> And it's, uh, you get six new ways to get arrested and to get 15 guys rich. 15 guys rich. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, anyway. Thanks for clearing it up for the person that wrote that. Uh, um, we have, I think, one more storyteller tonight. If that's, uh, two, two, Judd. Okay, well, one, uh, please give Judd a big round of applause. Judd, 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 Judd. Uh, I know a thing or two about trips, because I recently took one in L.A., but that's not my story. It was equally terrifying. Uh, so when I was a younger man, uh, after high school, I did a stint in federal penitentiary. I'm sorry, it was a, it was the military. It was the U.S. military. It was, it was great. It pays for my education now. Um, so maybe, maybe the gentleman that went before me knows what a blue falcon is. Does he? Anybody know what a blue falcon is? Okay, uh, it's a buddy effer. And one time I excelled at being a buddy effer, 600 times over. So, uh, when I was in the military, I was a meteorologist in the Air Force, and I had the longest training. Um, it's 10 months down in Keesler, Mississippi, right along the Gulf. It is so ungodly hot. So I started my training in November of 2008, and I finished in about July of the next year. But my whole squadron were a bunch of short shippers, so they were only there three weeks, four weeks. But then there's us who were salty and mad and upset every day that we're still being treated like dogs. So we had this new guy come in a new instructor come in in about March. And I, I graduated in, in mid-July. Staff Sergeant Samuel. I'll never forget the name because he's on the list. Everybody has a list. <laughs> and uh, everything was cool up until he got to our squadron. But he had a chip on his shoulder. He wasn't afraid to push you around. Uh, he wasn't afraid to yell, curse, throw your bedroom apart. Whatever he had to do to be the top dog. And we get it, dude. We're all in the military. Cool. But, dude, like, we all know what we're doing. We've been here for, like, eight months. It didn't work with him. So he was really heavy into physical training. <laughs> really heavy into it. Like, it was night and day. You know, we're used to, well, let's run four miles every afternoon and do some push-ups. Okay. He took it to a whole new level. He, but he didn't participate. <laughs> That's what really bothered everybody. Leadership that doesn't participate. So it got to the point where it was so bad that I was like, F this, I'm gonna go do other PT with the commander. Which was running seven and a half miles and doing push-ups and everything. And it was terrible, and it's why I'm going to need a knee replacement when I'm older. Just don't run on asphalt or runways for nine months, seven miles which is a lot of times back and forth. So what ended up happening was he's around for a few months, and I'm, I'm so pissed, I'm so mad that he's ruined my training. Every day I have to wake up and see his ugly face. So I'm smart. I'm smarter than him. And we have an anonymous feedback box. 
<laughs> we can put anything you want in there. What's the, what's going to happen? What's the, it's, it's anonymous. So I find some articles on the internet, which is always right. <laughs> and I, I cut out sections and I make them a document with all these instances and studies saying if military leadership does physical training and all the same training with their troops, you're going to have happier, better troops. And I'm like, yes. Everybody will appreciate this. They'll, they'll turn their back on this brutal way that we've been experiencing the past few months. So, I also knew enough, though, to schedule a dental appointment for the next day. I need to get my teeth cleaned, okay? I'm sorry. It just needed to happen. Maybe it was a coincidence, but I, I, I'm pretty sure I did that on purpose. So I go to the dentist that afternoon after sneaking out of my room at 10 p.m. to put in the anonymous feedback box this document saying that Staff Sergeant Samuel needs to PT with us. I actually wrote that. That was a terrible idea. <laughs> and in my squadron, there were about 600 people. And I go to school that day at 4 a.m. I wake up at 3.45. I go to the chow hall. I dip my breakfast. I go to class. And then after class, I'm like, yes, I got a dental appointment. I'm not going to PT. It's 98 effing degrees outside. I'm not doing it. So I go to dental. I have a great time. The hottest <laughs> dental tech. The hottest. Anybody working over you? you no. Know, if they have large breasts, they're going to be right in your face. I have a great afternoon from about 2 p.m. <laughs> to about 4.30 p.m. And I, I take my time going home. I'm just laughing basically, walking home, not even coordinated arm swing, not even marching. I'm just being a douchebag. Yeah. And then I get, I get back to the squadron about 4.45. Usually this is when everybody's packing up to go back into the dorm and change and then go to dinner. No, they were still out there. One, two, three, one, one, two. And they're not even they're not even doing push ups at this point. They're just like humping the ground like somebody's peed themselves. I'm not even kidding. And it's ninety eight degrees. It's like one degree away from black flag where you're not supposed to PT. And everybody's out there dying. They PT until six thirty PM. So they PT for four hours and People throwing up, they were peeing themselves, they didn't have enough water. Everybody in the in the training complex was just looking at us squadron like, what the hell did they do? So then well, you know, I actually had a follow-up appointment for the dentist. Because <laughs> I needed to get something like deep clean. I didn't tell anybody about this. So my roommate comes in, his name is Corbin. He was a finance guy. He was only there for four weeks. I was there for nine months. How do you think I feel, Corbin? <laughs> and he he was sick all night. He's like, oh my God. And so I'm like, what happened, dude? He's like, some a-hole put in the anonymous feedback box a letter with documents saying that Staff Sergeant Samuel needs to PT with us. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Who, who would do that? <laughs> well, I go to school the next morning. Everybody's dying. Uh, they, they are all dreading PT that afternoon. But I, I go to my dental appointment again. <laughs> the next morning, wake up at 3.45. We, we have formation at 4.30. <coughs> And um, I was actually a, in a leadership position. I was lining up my troops, doing head counts. And one of my one of my element leaders was like, "If I find out who possibly wrote that letter, I think I'm gonna haze the shit out of them." And I'm just like, "Huh? Yeah, it's a good thing we have tomorrow off, right?" And he's like, "No, we're gonna do PT all weekend." And I'm like, "Huh?" So. That day, I did go to PT, and because I was in a leadership position, I often helped lead PT, and I swallowed my pride. I got up in front of 600 people, and I admitted to being a soaring blue falcon. 
soaring over all of them. I got up in front of everybody and I said, I did it. I wrote that stupid letter. Let's start knocking out these push-ups. And then we were there for four hours. And then we were there all weekend. And everybody's arms, legs, everything just died. It, it eventually ended. But don't ever screw over 600 people. <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible thing to do. <laughs> Just imagine 600 people looking at you when you said something like that. <laughs> Jennifer is our last storyteller. Please give her a big round of applause. So this is the Army story. A little more hardcore than the Air Force. Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, not, I'm not a buddy fucker, if that's what we're talking. Uh, so I stood there at the ledge. And my heart was racing, my sweat was flowing, my brain was freaking. Because I was like a hundred feet on this ledge, looking at the cold concrete of my inevitable and predictable death. I was 18 years old, it was 1991, had no idea what the F I was doing. But uh, they paid for my school and I showed up. So I'm sitting there and I have a piece of rope practically non-existent, tied around my little ass, and it's got some Swisser sweet feet, and I have my brake arm, and I'm sitting there going, I'm so not equipped for this. I'm 18 years old, I'm from a little town in Texas, I love the Georgia story, it's one of my favorites, and I uh, was a nerd, and I was raised on Disney and damsels in distress, and there was no way in hell I was gonna rappel off of that freaking football stadium. TCU, go Bronx. So I uh, sit there, and you know, I had come from a home with very, very volatile, poor, dysfunctional, divorcing, blah, blah, blah parents. I had no self-esteem, but I had her. Cinderella had prepared me. And, and no way was this rappelling off of this stadium gonna lead me to any comfy castle or quaint carriage, or any happily ever after, I literally was scared out of my mind. Because if you can think about this, they want you to take this brake arm, turn around to this 100 feet ledge, back up, come perpendicular to this football stadium, and repel off of it. Let's do it. There's no training for this. Like 18 year olds are like, woo, you know, all these adrenaline ADD boys are like, I'll do it. So I, I'm like, okay. And, but I did have a necessary component of this story, if you want to go Cinderella here. I had a Ferris maiden on the ground who had already negotiated this, and her whole job was to take me down, because if she took me down and got in my head, then she was queen of this castle. What's wrong with you, cadet? Aren't you a badass? Let's do this. Now, she had a couple things that she could focus on. Uh, my frail self-esteem, that was clearly evident because I was very frightened, frozen, not, you know, the Disney kind, like actual frozen. And I'm sitting there, and so she's going, what's wrong with you? Let's do this. And I had these awesome, paid for by me in a payment plan, metallic, big braces. Like those kind that you look and you're like, wow, metal mouth, how you doing? And so she was like, continental. Don't get your train tracks. This is from the bottom of the stadium. She's shouting this out to me. Because she's prepared. She's been raised by Cinderella and Disney. And she's there to take me down because it's competition time, ladies. So she says, don't get your, 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 your metal mouth stuck in the rope. And so I'm like, oh, fuck. I could probably get my metal mouth stuck in this rope. <laughs> I'm like, this is a real. Nobody's prepared me for this. And then all of a sudden she's like, Rapunzel, your hair. What would you do with my hair? She's down there. I'm like, I don't need you. I'm already scared. So then I'm like, doesn't she know I was raised on Cinderella? Rapunzel was dumb because she had her hair all along and she never rescued herself. But Cinderella, you know, she had her ticket out. But then I'm like, wait, my hair is too long. I, it's really high. It's wind out there. My hair's flowing. And I'm like freaking out. And all of a sudden he steps in. So this is no prince. This is an African-American badass named Joseph Campbell who walked in and he saw all of this nonsense. He said, look in my eyes right now, cadet. Look in my eyes. 
nothing romantic, nothing creepy. He's like, you put your hand behind your back, you back up, and you never take your eyes off of me. And I was like, oh, shit, all right, let's do this. And so nothing romantic whatsoever, just pure leadership. No nonsense, what I always craved, what I never found anywhere else in my life. And he said, good, good, good. So I'm like, oh, I'm backing up. I can do this. So I had my brake hand, you know, my non-existent rope tied around my ass. And this also experienced 18-year-old Belayer, 100 feet below me. So I'm like going like this, and he's like, are you still looking at me? I'm like, uh, yeah, because I don't know what else to do. And she's still got her mouth going. So I go down, I go down, I go down. All of a sudden, I'm like, holy shit, I'm perpendicular to this TCU football stadium. This is pretty badass. And then it catches you. When your self-esteem catches you, you're like, oh, my God, I can do this. I can totally do this. He's like, don't take your eyes off of me. He's like, now extend that brake hand. I want you to extend it. And I'm like, all right. So wait, this is good. Okay, and so he looks and he goes, now I want you to extend it and bring it back. Extend it and bring it back. I can do that, no problem. So all of a sudden I extend it a little bit, and I fly. I flew off of that thing, and I was like, holy shit, this is fun. And so then I was like, I'm like, Joseph, see ya. And I extended so high, and I flew so high off that stadium. They were cheering, they were like, holy shit, that's awesome. And somebody all of a sudden shut up. And so then I go, and I go, and I'm at the end, and I'm like, repelling is the baddest, assest thing you've ever done, highly recommend. And I look up, and Joseph's smiling, beaming, way to go, cadet. And all of a sudden, my nemesis, has shut up. And I really want to straight to say this very emphatically. She was never taught to be happy for me. We ended up being best friends. I ran back up to the top of that stadium and I flew higher than anybody else. And four years later, I became battalion commander, the first nursing battalion commander, commander of that unit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This has been a, a really wonderful night. Unless we have another storyteller. Did, do you see another name down at the bottom? Because that means that we're done. But we're not done, really. Because you don't need a microphone to tell a story. You actually, um, every, everything that, every time we open our mouth, it's a story. And if we start to say with purpose, we start to, start to come from our heart, then we, uh, then we are actually uh, talking about ourselves and actually relating to people on a good level. And uh, one thing that you need to remember is listening is an act of love. And, uh, and in order to do that, you need to go out and tell your story or listen. And that's the most important thing. So um, please, oh, and, and I'm going to be uh, really getting a lot more involved in this mural thing. This is going to be completely... It, it, it's going to be downtown very soon, um, but right now we have to focus on one project at a time. But but if there's any way, you can message me on Facebook, you can talk to me any way that I'm around town. Um, get involved and let me know that you're interested, and uh, and I'd love to have your, your help or your um, feedback or anything, because this is uh, this is about painting the town. We're gonna we're gonna have. Um, we're going to make art in Bennington, so, and I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So anyway, please be well, have a great month, and uh, next month will be Vital Signs. Please have a good night.